Uh, welcome to our 11th Live After Lockdown event uh, and our finale. Uh, this series aims to visualize what life after lockdown will look like. Uh, today, we are looking at the role of entrepreneurship in Australia's recovery alongside our former PM, the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull. My name is Murray Herbs. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship for UGS. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral land our campus now stands. Uh, I'd also like to pay respect to elders past and present, acknowledging them as the tra traditional custodians of the knowledge for this land. So we've received over 300 questions from people attending this event. Uh, and we've been working through those questions, trying to distill them down to half a dozen or so. If we don't get to your question, uh, my apologies. Uh, Malcolm, I really don't think you need any introduction, uh, especially for our audience. Uh, but I would like to highlight your own entrepreneurial background, establishing a law firm, an investment banking firm, uh, investing in and being involved in several entrepreneurial efforts, including Aussie Mail and others that we'll cover shortly. Uh, you are an incredible example of what entrepreneurship can do to enable a career and true impact in the world. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Well, thank you very much. Great to be with you. So Australia made a choice to prioritise health in the pandemic uh, and was smart enough to ensure that we continued to support important exports so the economy wasn't completely brought to its knees. There are, however, many parts of the economy that have been devastated, airlines and tourism, for example. This gives us a once in a generation opportunity to lay the foundations for a new economy that addresses the inherent weaknesses. I firmly believe, as I'm sure you do too, that entrepreneurship is critical to rebuilding our economy and helping young Australians to navigate the uncertainty they now face. Today, I'd like to, your help, I'd like to have your help to explore what Australia can do to support this. So with that in mind, uh, let's start with your perspective on entre entrepreneurship. In a few sentences, could you describe what entrepreneurship is to you? Entrepreneurship is the spirit of enterprise, uh, the spirit of innovation, the preparedness to have a go, to to try something new. Uh, it's a it, it's a it, it's a fundamental human uh, quality because you know deep in our DNA, uh, we all yearn to be free, uh, to be autonomous, uh, to do things in our own unique way or what we think is our unique way. And so the entrepreneur is doing something very um, timeless, very human, very essential. But it's more essential now than ever, Murray, because, you know, as I've said for many years, and it's truer now than it's ever been, we're living in a time of change unprecedented in its scale and pace. And what that means is that you need to be as d dynamic, as agile, a bit overused, that adjective, but nonetheless, it's, it's valid agile, entrepreneurial, able to make volatility your friend, to, to enable it to work for you rather than against you. And all of that requires uh, an entrepreneurial approach. And that's true whether you're uh, running a, you know, a one person business, a startup, uh, or whether you're working in a division of a big company or indeed in a department of the public service. That is, that is a, entrepreneurship is a critical quality and more critical now than ever. On that point, uh, since last year, we've seen a new government, unprecedented <clears throat> bushfires, a global pandemic and a battered economy. How would you say Australia is going about recovery from that at, at the moment? Well, we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, and as we've seen in Victoria, uh, you know, things can go backwards after they've been going well uh, very rapidly. Um, look, I, I, think, I think you've got to say we've handled the pandemic so far better than many other countries, comparable countries, particularly the United States and the UK. You know, uh, so Australia and New Zealand have, have done very well uh, relative to others. But it is going to be a long haul back. You know, there's a lot of uh, unemployment. Uh, there's a lot of uh, unemployment that is masked by the uh, JobKeeper payments. They obviously can't be maintained forever. I expect they'll have to be extended. 
uh, but it is it's going it's it, look it's it's going to be a rough uh, a, you know a, a rough time and there are big sectors as you said in your introduction that look like being uh, devastated for a long time you know airlines travel tourism hospitality and you know you can you you know there's been this sort of false um, uh, paradigm of saying you've got a choice between health and the economy. Uh, but the reality is that even if you have no, and Sweden's a good example of this, I might add, but even if you have no uh, restrictions, no lockdowns, uh, once people start leaving aside the horrific health consequences of that and what it does to your hospital system, uh, people are not going to be rushing out into bars and restaurants if they think they're going to get seriously ill. So, you know, the, the truth is that pr prioritizing health, public health, which is what government should be doing, is also uh, the right thing to do in terms of the economy. Okay. Otherwise you, otherwise you get the worst of both worlds. You know, you get a health catastrophe with all of the attendant loss of life and illness that follows, and you get the same economic disruption because, you know, if people feel they're going to get a very serious disease from uh, going into crowded places, they're not going to go there. That's the thing that I keep getting stuck on. Uh, <clears throat> I ran a company from a, a bedroom for 14 years with teams around the world. Uh, if there was a pandemic, I wouldn't have really noticed. Uh, and it was a software driven company. Um, why is that not a more normal thing? Uh, why, uh, especially at the moment when, when we are locked at home, do we not start to look at this as an opportunity? To well, well, I think, well, I think we do. I mean, I mean, I think we do. If you look at sort of, if you try to, you know, say what is life going to look like post pandemic, the one thing that is clear is that we'll be doing more um, communi communications, more business, more engagement, interaction like this. You know, the, the, the pandemic has occurred at a time when in many countries you have near ubiquitous high speed broadband or at least fast enough to do video conferencing um, and of course the equipment and the applications that are affordable to enable you to do it i mean 20 years ago you simply couldn't have responded in this way but there is no prospect in my view that life even assuming there's a vaccine tomorrow and that, that medical challenge goes away uh, there's no way that uh, life will go back to the, precisely the way it was because more people will work remotely. I mean, I've always been, and as has Lucy, a believer in workplace flexibility. And in our own businesses, we, you know, long ago, we were uh, practicing that. And I was more, I was never in, interested in people showing FaceTime at the office. Uh, I was more only interested in what they produced. Well, now there literally are no excuses. I mean, we've, it's as though we've had this gigantic global experiment where we said, all right, let's all try working from home for a few months and see how it works. And it has for in, in many areas. I mean, obviously there are frontline workers, whether it's in retail or public transport or policing or above all healthcare where that isn't an option, but you can certainly mitigate the level of risk and increase the amenity. And I believe productivity for millions of people by having a more flexible approach to workplaces that this kind of technology entails. Now that has implications for cities. It has big implications for real estate. I don't know that you'd want to be long office space at the moment, would you? No, and I think that's the point. If the pandemic is a catalyzing moment for Australia, which I think it is, uh, and this spurs a new generation of people that see this as uh, the way to adapt to this environment and make the most of it. How do we go about normalizing that? So the conditions are there, but what can we do to make all Australians realize that entrepreneurship is something they can start doing in the current world and should be doing? <clears throat> well, I think if you, what one thing that's important is to talk about it. Uh, you know, I think the, the national innovation and science agenda, which was the, you know, the big economic policy we launched in 2015, not long after I became Prime Minister, you know, has had a very, very beneficial impact. I think everyone agrees in terms of, you know, the whole tech startup innovation ecosystem in Australia. Um, but, and, and there are lots of measures. I think there are over two dozen measures, in fact, 
uh, right, ranging from tax to insolvency laws to setting up, you know, new funds and so forth. But I think in many ways, the most important thing that I did was talking about innovation a lot. Uh, and you've got to talk about it and encourage people and point to successful role models. And really, in many respects, it's a cultural change that you're looking for. Because, you know, the thing that holds us back in so many areas is cultures, particularly cultures in workplaces and businesses and government departments, which are hierarchical and blame based. So if you have a culture in your business or your department, which says, if you try something new and it doesn't work out, you will get jumped on like a ton of bricks. And if by some chance you, <laughs> it does work out, it's more likely than not that a superior will appropriate the victory and claim the rewards. In, those, in that kind of culture, which probably sounds very familiar to many people on this call, um, the rational actor does nothing and makes no decisions. So you've got to have a, a culture which encourages people to take risks. They've got to be obviously prudent. You don't want to bet the, you know, the whole farm on every roll of the dice, but equally, uh, unless you're prepared to experiment, you'll, you'll, you'll never advance. And that's, that has been a, that's a critical thing. Blame-based cultures are very uh, antithetical to innovation and the, uh, you know, the growth in productivity that we're going to need. How do we change that? So, for example, are there things in schools that we can be doing or, or universities to get to people before that's in, indoctrinated? Inside? Well, I, yeah, well, I think it's a, it, it, it requires leadership. Uh, it's, um, you know, often it's just a question of being honest. Uh, I remember on one occasion when I was PM, I think it was at first, on the first occasion with the NISA, I was asked by some journalists, you know, did I, could I guarantee that all of these measures would work? And I said, no, I, I'm sure some of them won't work. Uh, and they don't, whatever doesn't work, we'll dump. Whatever does work, we'll do more of. And if we see someone else achieving the same objective, more effectively, we'll shamelessly plagiarize them. That's easier to do with public policy than it is, than it is with software and technology where you have intellectual property issues. But, but you get my point, you know, you, you, you can't get yourself hung up on the proposition that everything you do, every decision you make is gonna be right, because it's not going to be. But you, you will see governments will hang on to policies that have failed for much longer than they should. You know, they, 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 they don't fail fast, as you should do. And the reason for that is because they're, they don't want to admit they've, quote, made a mistake. Well, it's not a mistake. I mean the, you, you know, the, the best thing you can say about any new approach is it's the best idea I have at the time. Not, not, not that it's, you know, it's comes with a guarantee because nothing does. I do have a world of sympathy for people that work in government and have to deal with that kind of situation. Mm. Uh, looking at the current situation and the responses that are being made to it. Uh, for example, the JobKeeper program uh, supports companies started up until May but notably doesn't support companies started after then. Hmm. Uh, the job maker program as announced in May, uh, it's focused on skills development. Would you say these are the right ways of going about generating new entrepreneurship through a government lens? Well, I think job keeper was simply just designed to stem a, you know, a flow of millions of people onto, un onto the unemployment queues. Uh, and main it was essentially a holding pattern measure uh, what the government's got to do now is look at it very carefully, see which bits of it have worked, which haven't, where the anomalies have been, and then come up with a, you know, a revised model that's uh, re revised in the light of the real life experience. Um, you clearly can't, you, you clearly don't want to be um, using government money to keep people in jobs that have gone or are no longer able to be sustained otherwise what you need then is the economic growth in other parts of the economy so that other opportunities will arise you know that's the i mean the the uh you know there's always a tendency to want to um throw money at a business that is failing uh to keep people in employment and that's you know that's 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 a natural human reaction 
But that's why a strong, innovative economy is so important because as one business falls over or fails, for whatever reason, you know, it may just be poor management, it may be the pandemic, it may be competition, uh, there is growth elsewhere in the economy to pick those, uh, to create other opportunities. So, so you know, in, entrepreneurship and startups are critically important. And if I could just make this point about startups, there is a tendency uh, with governments. I mean, obviously my government was an exception because of my own experience, but there's a tendency with governments to discount the startup economy and discount software uh, because they see it as not being real, being a bit ephemeral. The reality is that in a startup, the only people who can potentially lose out are the investors. And even they will often, you know, learn a lot. But the founders learn a lot. The employees are paid uh, and pay tax, I might add, to the government. And they learn a lot too. And so, you know, a startup economy is one that is actually, uh, even though most startups will not succeed, it is hugely beneficial to the uh, economy as a whole. If you look at it from, a, from you know, an Australia-wide whole of economy basis, it's hugely beneficial. You know, some investors will do their dough and they obviously that's, you know, they'll do their dough in the stock market. They'll do their dough in real estate development. I mean, there's plenty of ways to lose money. But, the, but what, what it does do is train people up, give them real life experience that then enables them to go on and you know, be productive in some other area. They may decide it's all too hair raising and they'll go and get a job with a larger company or they may go on to another startup, which turns out to be a hit. And we've all, I mean, I, I, Luce and I've started, I would say over a dozen businesses or co-started over a dozen businesses in our lives. Some of them have done very well. Some of them were complete and utter, un, you know, write-offs, literally 100%, 100% of the money lost. Uh, and others wash their face. But, you know, we learned from every one of them. That's the thing. I think companies can fail, but no entrepreneur fails to get something valuable from their experience of doing it. Yeah. And if that prepares you for the next success. Wonderful. Well, that's, well, that's, 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 that is absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, notably, you invested $500,000 into Aussie Mail. Uh, and five years later, sold your stake for $57 million. Uh, congratulations. Oh. Uh, we do have some vehicles for encouraging investment into startups, but I would argue we've got probably stronger incentives for investment into real estate in Australia, uh, or at least that's a more normal pathway that people take. Yeah, you well, real, more real that can be done? yeah, well, real estate's been a bit of a, a one-way bet, you know, because you've had the combination of very low interest rates and very... Uh, strong asset appreciation. So, you know, that's so the you know, the, I mean, uh, look, I, I have invested in real estate. I've got to say my real estate investing track record is patchy. You know, I've, I've lost money on real estate in markets where most people are making money. So I wouldn't claim any expertise there. And I had a bad experience in the late eighties, you know, in the recession we had to have when interest rates were 21% and so forth. And so my own investing has been more focused at taking an unlevered dollar and turning it ideally into $10, you know, or $5 or $15. Whereas what a real estate investor typically does is, uh, you know, uh, borrows $9, uh, then buys something for $10 and then hopefully sells it for $12 and thereby triples their, their equity investment. So it's a different, it's a different mindset, but that cheap money has been what has really made it a one-way bet because in, you know, previous eras, uh, I mean, in the late eighties, we were in a, we had some commercial property where, you know, the tenants went broke and the interest rates were up, as I said, up around 21%. I think we were paying on bills at that time. Well, that's just devastating, you know, that's ruinous, but that's a completely different world. When you talk about that to young people nowadays, they, you may as well be talking about the Weimar Republic, I might say. <laughs> it seems so unreal. I mean, Lucy and I, when we bought our first uh, home, we borrowed money. We managed to borrow money at 17%. <laughs> so think Can't about that. Okay, yeah. hopefully uh, we never end up there again. Yeah, well, uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. So yeah. we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, yeah. 
I, I want to say quickly, over the last two years, uh, UTS has grown the largest community of student launched startups in Australia. Uh, we're at about 340 student launched technology driven startups currently in our program. Yep. Uh, also in the process of opening a new high visibility space to inspire entrepreneurship in the public. Um, but that's just a kind of UTS driven agenda of trying to create not just graduates, but jobs for graduates as well. I, I am interested, what do you think the role of universities is in driving entrepreneurship? Well, it's hugely important because you're not only uh, providing instruction uh, in entrepreneurship as you are, uh, but you've obviously also people are learning the, the necessary technical skills, the quantitative skills, the business skills. So, uh, but above all, it's a place where uh, entrepreneurial people particularly the students, most of them young, are getting together. You know, I mean, this is, this, this, by the way, uh, is the, is, is the sort of the proviso to what we were talking about earlier when we were discussing, you know, uh, video conferencing and remote working and so forth. I mean, we are, we are, human beings are social animals. You know, we are um, allegedly better evolved chimps or apes or whatever. Uh, and like our, um, you know, our, uh, our counterparts in the monkey kingdom, we are social animals. You know, we like to hang out together. We are very, very sociable and we spark off each other. And we, and that, that human, that human connection is of course, what drives cities. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting when the internet first got commercial, say in the mid nineties, a lot of people were foretelling the end of the city because frankly, they were forecasting that we'd all be doing the kind of stuff we're being forced to do now. So, you know, you could, I could stand here and in a nice garden in the countryside and be talking to you and lots of other people, you know, in, in the city, but, but real, I, I, I don't think there's any substitute for physical face-to-face -face engagement, particularly as people are getting to know and trust each other because so much of, business and collaboration depends on trust. So, you know, universities and the ability to congregate and collaborate are, are vitally important. You know, this is, you know, one of the reasons why we've got to hope that we can get a, uh, either a therapeutic or a uh, vaccination solution to this pandemic before too long. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the last two questions I'd like to ask. Uh, so, UTS engages with a huge number of future students. Uh, and I'd love to get a message out to those future students about what they should do to consider entrepreneurship or whether they should consider entrepreneurship. If you could look down the camera and send a message to a few hundred thousand future students about whether they should consider entrepreneurship or not, uh, well, please do. Look, Australia's future, prosperity and security depends on Australian entrepreneurship and innovation. So not only does entrepreneurship offer an exciting prospect, an interesting prospect, both for study and for, you know, your business life, commercial life, it gives you the set of skills and attitudes that will enable you best to navigate a very volatile world and make volatility your friend, not your foe critically important. It gives you an understanding uh, of optionality and its significance. And particularly if you couple it with the right technical skills, including quantitative ones, uh, equips you to deal with uh, circumstances and opportunities that are not just unseen uh, or unpredicted, but unforeseeable. Okay, perfect. Uh, and uh... Lastly, uh, when, I'm, when I am out in high school, the most common question that I get asked by students is what should I tell my parents about this thing that I'm running on the side, which makes me sad every time I hear it. Um, mm -hmm. If you had a message for all the parents out there and all the teachers about there about encouraging entrepreneurship in young Australians, what would that be? Well, I would be, I would be saying, well, you know, you could say a bunch of different things to your parents. You could say, look, just because you're my parents uh, doesn't mean you can turn uh, my foregone rent into a piece of equity in the seed round. 
Um, uh, <laughs> but you, the most and for parents themselves, uh, yeah. what would the message be from well, you well, to message, those parents? Well, the message, obviously, Murray, is that uh, look, most parents would welcome this. I mean, it is you know the the reality is if a young person starts a business or an enterprise, what is the downside? I mean, they may they may lose some money, or their investors may lose some money, as we discussed before. But the young person learns so much. I mean, it is it literally, it is there is no substitute for actually starting something new and learning on the job. You can you know you can read all the books about entrepreneurship and innovation you like, but there's no substitute for actually doing it. And so getting in and having a go is enormously valuable and that will stand that person in good stead if you know after their venture doesn't succeed let's assume it doesn't succeed uh, you know if they whether they go off and work in a government department or you know a big institution or academia or whatever i mean it, look i think it is you, you've got to be prepared in this world more than ever to look at what you are doing and saying you know, the way we did things last week is not necessarily the way we should be doing them this week or next week. And you've got to be able to, to just, that, that, that in it, you see, you can't, you cannot work on the assumption that everything is going to stay the same because it's not. Our environment, and I don't just mean our physical environment, but our economic, our social, our political environment is in a constant state of change and that means that we've got to be prepared to take advantage of that because, you know, otherwise you'll just get left behind. Fantastic. Uh, in the two minutes we've got left, uh, I'll go to one audience question that I really liked. In the future, Canberra may have a suburb named Turnbull as per tradition. What do you envisage uh, your suburb to be like? <laughs> That's a, well, that is one of those rare questions I've never ever thought about before. Uh, I've got, well, I'll tell you what I would like my, I'll tell you the sort of suburb I like, I like, I like suburbs that are reasonably dense, um, in terms of cities. So there is a, a density coupled with amenity. So I suppose something that is uh, reasonably dense and has got good, um, connectivity, both, you know, in terms of telecoms, obviously, but also in terms of, uh, mass transit. So, you know, I think. I mean, Canberra, Canberra was based, you know, Canberra's, you know, got a lot, lot of things going for it in terms of design, but it was built around the motor car, which is, you know, the great mistake. And the efforts at densification closer to the centre, including around Kingston, uh, where, where we used to have a flat, uh, is, um, has certainly improved the amenity of the city. But, you know, I, I despite you know, all of the problems of the pandemic. I still believe in cities density is the solution, not the problem, but you've got to couple it with the right amenity. And that in particular means, um, uh, you know, transport, uh, mass transit in particular. That's why I made public transport uh, such a high priority for our city's agenda. Again, that was a, a first, particularly for a, um, a liberal uh, federal government. Okay. And uh, entrepreneurs flocking there in large numbers for the dense, wonderful environment, I'm sure. Uh, well, there, is, there, is actually, there is actually quite an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial scene in Canberra, you know, in the tech, there is. tech world. And uh, a lot of it, because you get very smart people coming out of the, um, you know, defence technology, the Australian Signals Directorate and so forth, and, you know, doing their own thing. So there is, a, there is an ecosystem there um and that's that's good and it's only three hours drive from sydney too after all i mean it's it's uh it's not exactly a remote location okay already making the sales pitch for turnbull in canberra i uh, looking forward to it <laughs> well, you've got, <laughs> you've got, i hope it's a lot well look for a start I, i'm not sure that it would ever happen but the one thing i do know is they don't name anything after ex-prime ministers until they're dead so i hope whenever such a, a suburban name was uh, arose if it ever did i hope it's a very long way off because i'm having a great deal of fun getting on with business and in venture capital today me too and uh, uh malcolm uh you have made a contribution to australia's future that i think is incredible uh and i'm confident uh that everyone watching appreciates it as well 
thank, thank you, you for much. joining us today. Uh, thank you for everything you've done and that you continue to do uh, for Australia. Thanks, Murray. Thank you. And good wishes to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark.